Brother in Christ, Lord day to Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to the Lay Apostolate. This is a series all about being a lay person, all about lay questions, things that lay people deal with every day. And one of those things is moral theology, because we have different moral questions. We're going to talk a little bit about them. And to talk about that is returning guest and my good friend, Dr. Matthew Minard. Dr. Minard, how are you doing? Doing really well today, Timothy. How are you? Uh, I'm too blessed to be stressed. The, uh, the, the bitter winter of Michigan is, is currently thawing, so we're enjoying the springtime now. So, And it's also spring ember tide as if you're in the Roman Rite, so we're kind of liturgically celebrating spring this week. But we're talking about your book. Now, is this, is this your, the, the only book that you have written because you've translated many, many different texts? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. I mean, okay. the, the introduction to that, the recent one with CUA about the Nobel Theology crisis, I mean, there's an extensive intro, so it's about 90 yes. pages. Then the Conscience book has a pretty long intro that's mine. Um, but most right. of my other stuff is all just articles, academic okay. articles. So yeah, this is my only kind of complete book. Yeah, so this is, uh, I, I, I'm I, interested to hear about the generation of this book, Dr. Miner, which gets into the topic, of course. Uh, first of all, you can you can buy this book below, click the link below to buy this. It's called made, made by God, Made for God, Catholic Morality Explained. So, so two, two pronged questions to start us off then. One, uh, since you've translated so many different texts and done such a service to the church and translating so much of Gary Lagrange, what made you want to write your own text? And that goes into the second part of the question is, what was the sort of gap in moral theology today? That you were trying to fill with this book? Well, I think we still actually have a, a gap. There are some texts out there you can use for teaching, and that's not what this book is actually even written at the level of that. I mean, it's I know some undergraduate professors who use it, but it's actually more at the level of, uh, I don't call it popular, but that's the best I can say at popular level. Uh, so there still is a kind of gap in, in contemporary teaching texts for moral theology. But the text actually started because one of my deacon students at the Ruthenian Seminary was a project manager at Ascension. And he approached me about the idea after our class. And I, I'll be honest, I didn't like the proposal, the way they wanted the book to be written. Um, and so I just sort of shooed it away and I forgot about it. He came back to me nine months later or so and you know, sort of said, okay, well, what do you wanna do? And they gave me more flexibility for the, the approach I wanted to have, um, you know, more Thomistically inspired. Uh, it's been commented, I think, correctly. There's a connection clear between the book and spiritual theology. Although it's not a work of spiritual theology, my treatment of the theological virtues goes in that direction more so, which is a certain vein that comes to me from Garrigou and Gardet and others. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to say that I said, hey, can I have complete editorial control? But I said, can I have significant direction of this project? And when they said yes, you know, I said, we'll come back and decide if, you know, you, you like or don't like what I come across with. Um, you know, in the, in the end, they were they were pleased with what we did. And then we you know did the editing. It was during that summer. You know, we, we didn't live in uber shutdown mode here in Western Pennsylvania, but it was during that COVID summer is whenever this thing really got drafted. So, you know, you're spending a lot more time at home anyway. Right. Each okay. day, my wife, you know, got her comments, uh, et cetera. Oh, uh, your wife read it, you say? I read each chapter to her. We'd actually go. Oh, nice. Things. I mean, we would go and do other things. We weren't totally shut in at all. But, like, you know, in the evening, because you're kind of here and other people didn't want to get together, you didn't have as busy of a schedule, we'd walk up and down our driveway, um, oh, which is great. long enough to kind of go up and down. And the baby right. was, was in the stroller and we'd be going nice. around. And I'd read it out loud. And even if she didn't say anything, I'd catch things that I knew were would be confusing to her. Like just having a person in front of me would catch things at tone level because i wanted to make it really accessible so yeah you know yeah there's footnote there end notes which try to make up for that right that's the academic in me but you know it's it's actually very i mean it that's the reason it's so scriptural if you sort of recognize that in the text how much especially in that first maybe half or first three-fifths it's super scriptural that's just because i figured using scripture as the primary locus which is all also a good thing to do theologically it would keep me from getting into thomas stuff that's under the hood Right. I'm doing Thomism, yeah. but it's in a sense, it's hidden in the background so that it doesn't turn people off uh, because of technical vocabulary. Right. Yeah. And one of the one of the strengths and what I'm grateful for you for is that um, there 
are, I think there are many Catholics out there who uh, think that the Thomist view on any particular thing, like a moral question, is the Catholic view per se in and of itself because it's Thomas. But as you state in the text, you actually mention one of them at later on in the fasting chapter. You say, oh, well, the Thomas say this, the Franciscans say this. I'm more on the Thomas side, but here's the general gist of it. And that's what I've liked about some of the as other texts, like um, I think Primer does that, but also Ludwig Ott mentions like, here's all the different schools and here's their opinions. And uh, now, but that brings up St. Alphonsus because St. Alphonsus's moral theology does, does all these discussions as, so he, he takes a moral question. I'm, I'll give you this example that we discussed, the Sunday obligation. What Alphonsus does is he has, okay, here's a moral question. And then here's what they say. Here's what they say. This guy says this, this authority says this. I think the theological note is this. So here's my opinion at the sort of gathering it all together. And uh, one of the most ubiquitous questions, especially you just mentioned the COVID tyranny right there. That's a great example as well. Um, whether it's COVID tyranny or it's uh, irreverent masses, various liturgical abuses happening and that are happening in the Roman Rite, um, one lay question is what to what degree am I excused from my Sunday obligation to attend to hear Mass uh, in those situations? Um, and that would get into the place of St. Alphonsus. So, how do you approach that one, Dr. Munnard? Okay, boy, you gave me a, a big. <laughs> And I know we only have 45 minutes. You know, I, I did dark all those, those COVID days. That's when I did a lot of those videos online. And I got in the bad habit of going too long because I just had endless time in front of me. <laughs> so, okay, let me set the ground and then we'll step by step get to the answer because I, I think that I'll give a kind of comprehensive answer if I do this. So St. Alphonsus' uh, moral theology text, the multi-volume. <clears throat> Theologia Moralis, which is being, it's, it was, I think, Mediatrix or someone, someone was doing translations of it. A little bit literalistic, but that's fine. I mean, as a translator, I'm always very understanding. Yeah, there's a series of those coming out. Yeah. So it, um, that text, actually, it, it dates from whenever moral, let's back up, moral theology in the West, and let, I'm not even necessarily contrasting the East because it's kind of different. It's just a different bag of tricks there uh, to, to discuss. But the, what's the temptation for moral theology? Who are you training? Priests. What do priests have to deal with morally? Questions of the confession or of confessional, right? So that is, even at the time of Thomas Aquinas, kind of a structural thing, the penitentials. You know, you learn your moral theology in a sense as, as a kind of practic practical um, ability to handle the confessional. And even in the period after Thomas's death, there's this real pressure within the Dominican order to say, yeah, 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 yeah. There's all this other stuff in the Summa Theologiae. And I know you guys really would like us to teach with it, even though we're not teaching with it. But look, can you make us a digest of sections of the, the specific moral things, especially like the treatise on justice, so that we can have like a guide for what are sins or what are not, and then how to handle the confessional. So this, this general need to train confessors and to discern conscience cases is, is something that actually goes back quite a bit. And it, it is founded in a very important phenomenon in the church life, right? That moral theology kind of lives in the priestly life, especially in the context of the confessional. So I say all of that to say that what I'm about to say about the period around St. Saint, Saint Alphonsus is, is not totally as negative as you find even among certain Thomists today who very much dismiss this casuistry or this study of cases of conscience, which really is not quite what Alphonsus is doing anyway in the Theologia Moralis. But if you look at his his text, the way it's laid wait, out, wait, let me just stop for a minute. Can you just define casuistry because that word has been thrown around? Oh. I don't even, I don't even know what that means. No, no, that's fine. I thought my little my little uh, aside was enough, and that's good for you to pull me in. Think of the word itself. All that casuistry means in general is a kind of study of cases of conscience. How do you figure out, for instance, in what case is your conscience bound to go to uh, mass or not? Um, you know, where where does the law cease with regard to questions of fasting and church rules? Um, you could, you know, all sorts of things with regard to contracts, um, precepts of the church. Um, what are the? This is a very standard way of approaching the the theological virtue of faith from a casuistic perspective. Is how do you discern what is required, for instance, of like the laity to know explicitly? Because not everybody is bound in the church to to know the mysteries of the faith with the same depth. Yeah, I think, um, I think lay, laity are, are thinking of a very casuistic way. They're just like, well, what am I supposed to do? I want to do it. 
I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Give me the requirements and I'll follow the rules. Yeah. And the general and the general thing is to get there is to sort of where the line of the rule is, right? And it it does tend toward a kind of minimalism. But you know, technically, if you pick up an ascetical book, be it a Western book or a monastic book, that's also a kind of I use it broader casuistry because you're considering what do I do to overcome this or that vice, right? Or how do I fight this passion, as the Byzantines would say. It's a kind of uh, again, analysis of cases of conscience. But very specifically, it became this analysis in the West that was a really concerned with where does the moral law bind me? Where am I not bound? Okay. And it's an important question, right? It's not just something that kids ask whenever they're teenagers about how far can I go with my girlfriend, right? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it is something we all ask. It's just kind of a minimum line. Okay. So the, the, um, the way of doing theology, moral theology, is already tending in that direction of asking like that kind of question, right? What are the principles for discerning cases of conscience, especially with regard to where the law basically binds my freedom or where I'm free to act? And there are critiques of that way of asking the question. I think legitimate critiques, people like Father, even Father Garagou Lagrange will have a kind of criticism of it, Father Labradat, Father... Um, uh, Surveys been cares very famously and others. But St. Alphonse is basically actually, he takes a book by, um, I can't remember right now, I think he's a, a Jesuit named Herman. Yeah, I think it's a German Jesuit, I think. Busenbaum. And he takes Busenbaum's moral text and he, he uses it from a, a teaching perspective and he keeps reworking it to the point that after a number of editions, the text becomes Alphonse's own. And there are various systems of analyzing conscience at the time. We don't need to go down into that hole, but you can basically think of it this way. There's a much more lax approach known as historically as probabilism. And it's, it's you know, you only have to have kind of probable certitude that something's not sinful in order to do it. But then there are kind of exceptions to that, like to make it so that you don't fall off the, the edge of being a total laxist. And then there's there's kind of Tudorism, which is often associated, for instance, with Jansenism. Um, but it's you know effectively that when there's any moral doubt, you always have to do whatever's the most rigorous thing. Okay. And and so this basic debate of how to like figure out the cases of conscience and apply kind of general rules for discerning when are you, when you should or shouldn't act launches about 300 years worth of Western history of of different systems of moral analysis. There's probabilism, there's there's two-tierism, do the safest thing. There's probabiliarism, which is the classical Dominican position. You need a more probable certitude. But what does that mean? You they have to define what they mean, right? It gets to the point that these the treatments of conscience in someone like Daniello Concina, a Dominican during this era, become like 700 pages long. Just like this just is, the treatment this of is, conscience. They're, they're debating these three schools, three plus schools for 300 years up to the year 1800, which is about when uh, it's about uh, I'd say it's about 150 to 200 up to Alphonsus, okay. and then it, it continues thereafter as the Western mode of teaching moral theology for probably another 100, 100 years or so. Because Alphonsus is doc he's proclaimed doctor of moral theology, I think, by Gregory the Sixteenth, I re if I recall, or Pius. It's in the 19th century sometime. Yeah, that's you see, I I, I'm correct I, about that or not, but I think it's Pius the Ninth. Okay. Um, because yeah, and then I mean Pius the Twelfth kind of reiterates it as well at some point near the middle of the century. Um, so he, he devises a different sort of an analytical system, very much based on his experience as a lawyer, uh, called equiprobabilism just means you start off. It, 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 here's the, here's the better way to think of it. Actually, it's, you, you, you think of your, you have two litigants, freedom law, you have to figure out who has, which, which has standing. And then based on that, you analyze, you then analyze the need for probability and there's this issue of then what do you do with the cases where there's still kind of uh, a lack of certitude, what you should do. Okay. Um, it was 1871. I see now when he Pius, was proclaimed right. doctor of the church or doctor of moral theology. Yeah. Pius the so, Ninth. Sorry. Go ahead. So, now here's, here's the thing though. Busenbaum's structure is very different, for example, than Thomas Aquinas' structure of moral theology. Mm -hmm. The way, the way you can do this. And I, I pulled up a number of PDFs just to make sure I was double checking and not living on, you know, rumors of bad things that I was told when I was younger. Um, you see it, you see it in both Alphonsus and the the later like digests that were made for seminary. Because Alphonsus was too technical. So you know you had for instance a famous uh, Guri and Ballerini, uh, two Jesuits, wrote a manual that was used very widely. Um, and so the the basic outline though of of the treatises, and I know this sounds like, you know, I'm just picking at little details, but it tells you a lot. The structure of a theologian tells you a lot about kind of the principles that are operative in 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 his thought 
And then it tells you how someone who learns moral theology is going to think about, well, what is moral theology? So it starts right out of the bat for Alphonsus with conscience. So his concern in Alphonsian moral theology is very much concerned with what you find in the end, like in something also like his praxis for confessors, right? The discernment of conscience. So we're going to open up with the nature of conscience. We're then going to talk about um, immediately then precepts of the law. Now, the pre t using the Decalogue as a way of kind of cutting up human acts is something that catechetically at least is going to go back to the Roman catechism, probably before, right? That doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's because it's a normal thing, right? You, Augustine preaches on the Ten Commandments. So um, that being said, uh, Thomas Aquinas doesn't split up moral acts at all like that. He splits them up according to virtues and he splits them up according to the three theological virtues and then the, the four cardinal virtues and the connected virtues to them. And that's just, it's a very different analytic framework. The way that Thomas lays everything out is like, here, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an analysis of what the virtue is in itself. What are its acts? It's a very um, scientific analysis. And then only in light of that, I'll show you now, what are the acts that are opposed to it? Right. Okay. So that's like, Garrigou Lagrange, actually, who's very deferential to Alphonsus. He has this wonderful line at the beginning of his Beatitude commentary. He says, you know, in the midst of all the squabbling between the probabilists and, and the equiprobable or the uh, probabiliarists and everybody else, there finally came and you know, strode forth Alphonsus to sort of set things at least in balance. And yet there are other places in the exact same introduction where Garrigou says, if you look at a lot of the manuals today and, you know, I don't know how much of this is him just not calling it out or how much of it he just couldn't imagine critiquing a saint. He's critiquing the format that comes down from Alphonsus. He says, the way they're laid out around the precepts makes moral theology seem more like a discipline concerned with sins that you need to avoid rather than with virtues to be inculcated or virtues uh -huh. to, to be um, you know developed and ultimately tied into the mystical life. Yeah. So Alphonsus's structure, therefore, is very much concerned with the, the problem of, I think the best way to think of it is, what is a moral theology that's particularly uh, directed toward uh, confessors and pastors who are, who are helping their faithful, especially figure out whether or not they've fallen into sin, most especially then distinguishing mortal and venial sin. Um, that being said, as a kind of full scientific theology, it's only one little subdivision of what like the big thing is in St. Thomas. At the turn of the century, 20th century, there are attempts to try and figure out, well, where can we put in the Alphonsian kind of approach within uh, moral theology? This gets derailed because of just the discontinuities of the last century. I think it's actually still an outstanding issue because there's a there's a real undercurrent among Thomas today that basically would totally sideline Alphonsus. And this is even among very faithful Thomists. I mean, super faithful uh, Thomists. Um, one of the reasons why I published the conscience text, actually, I did this translation of um, some Thomist texts on conscience, was because the figures I gathered in that text, um, especially two of them, two of them are very concerned with basically taking seriously some of this conscience development um, that, that, uh, that you have in the, the, tradition coming down out of Alphonsus. Okay. Thank you. You're like, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to pull up the, uh, so, the conscience book. It's here somewhere, right? Yeah. It'll just a little bit further. Do, 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 okay. do. So there's a four Thomistic treatments. Yeah. So the, the father Merkelbach and, um, especially the Reginald Baudouin texts in there, the latter is very dry, but it, it's very much an attempt to figure out how can we incorporate uh, equiprobabilism, not just alongside Thomism, but in a sense, work it in to the an analysis of, of morality um, that we find in, in the summa structure, right? So let me let me ask a, a general con yep. concluding my question based on what you're saying. So would you say, because um, would you say that the Jesuits are more in the probabilism lax category and the Dominicans are more in the rigorous category? And where do you put where do you put, uh, and uh, well, then Alphonsus would be sort of the equipubilism, I think. And yeah, then and he, where, where do you put this guy here? Prumer. I've got a nice uh, coffee, coffee stain on my edition here. Oh, I, I should, I should, I should, uh, should say the, this is the centenary edition that just Benedictus books just put this one out. Prumer. So where do you put Prumer in all this? 
And yeah. am, I, am I accurate in describing the different schools of thought? Yeah. His, historically, very much so. I mean, there are people who say that just as some of your listeners might know about like the, the predestination debates between the Jesuits and the Dominicans, right. there's some people who say that stuff should have come to an end and the Jesuits and the, you know, the Molinists should have been the found guilty. De auxilies. Kind yes, of yeah, exactly. Well, there are others too who say that, that the, I can't remember, I think the suppression of the Jesuits might have been what got in the way of like stopping this series of condemnations against probabilist theses that kept getting closer and closer to the mainstream of the Jesuits. Uh, for a long while, the Jesuits were able to sort of come up with exception cases that kept them from being laxists, but they were by far the more, the, the broader. And it's, it's as someone once said, the, the Jesuits want to, to get as many people into heaven and Dominicans want to have as much of heaven here on earth. Is sort of a, a way people put it. So the well, Dominicans, you got to have both, right? <laughs> you, you do need a bit of correction because here's why: the Dominicans were so rigorous. I can't remember if Conchina was one of the opponents of Alphonsus, but at the time of Alphonsus, he was he was held to be, in the view of the Dominicans, as being effectively a, a probabilist like the Jesuits. Okay. And the Jesuits, of course, who wanted to get him as well because they wanted his authority, right? Uh, so he it was, it was there, there was a, a whole literature even in the late 19th century and early 20th century of people trying to say, well, Alphonsus is actually really just one of us. Um, so Prumer, um, I would have to look. I do. I did pull up just to have a general layout. His, um, his three-volume text in right. front of me. Um, this is just the just so everybody knows. This is a summary of a three volume set that's only in Latin. Yeah, and so I, I think it's fair to say that he's he's probably a probabilist with, or a, you could say he's an he's a an Alf, he has Alphonsian lines who that leans in maybe a probabilist direction in his casuistry when he does it. Um, I don't think he's openly trying to just be an equiprobabilist. And this is important to remember because the church left latitude. This is actually why you got confused, I think, with regard to who it was who made him doctor of the church. Because in, 18, in the 1830s, there was already a declaration that was made that basically, if you're a confessor, you can safely take the opinions of Alphonsus. Oh, right, right, right. And the idea there was not that you have to use them, but you basically don't. The, the Pope even said, you don't even need to know, understand the reason for it. You can just use that opinion, and it's it's to be considered safe. That okay. that particular analysis of a sin, if you're dealing with a confessional, you can just take it as a, um, you know, as as a given. Okay. So Pr Prumer is, uh, if you read his big book, he's already at a period where Dominican formation is moving away from the layout in Alphonsus. They're going back to to trying to teach the order that Thomas Aquinas's moral theology treatise. Is laid yeah, out. It seemed like it seemed like his structure was a little bit more like that. But yeah, he's more. He's less rigorous compared to the other Dominicans. I would. I would. Have would, been I, would I would think that he's. I, I. I think that. And this is like I said. I, I actually would have to go and look at the cases and consider this. Uh -huh. But there is. There's enough in his formation a generation earlier where the Dominicans want to be a bit more in line with Alphonsus. And so there's a, a, a tendency toward a kind of equiprobabilism. Okay. Uh, I would say probably the safe thing for me, like if I'm thinking right now of interpreting those texts, so you're just seeing my mind as I go into sort of research mode, it's I bet yeah. that what I'm going to find is that there's going to be something that's like Alphonsus's position, but slightly more rigorous is what I would think if we started so, looking at case studies. So you have to so, remember the yeah. whole forest, like you said, there's a forest of case studies because yeah. the, Maybe not as much in Prumer, but definitely in Alphonsus, because it's such a long book that there are all these different authorities on 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 the different um, cases of the precepts. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I, I was just reading a, the latest book by Kwasniewski, Bound by Truth, and he has a chapter about the Sunday obligation. And it's interesting because he quotes from uh, two different, oh, I think it's three different, no, four different Jesuit manuals. We have uh, Herbert Joan, Moral Theology, Davis, Moral Theology, Slater, SJ, Moral Theology. And then we have some OPs, Callan and McHugh. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these were surprised. All these quotes to me were very surprising in the sense that they seem to be way more lax about this Sunday application that I, they were listing all these exceptions. I didn't even know that anybody thought those were legitimate. Like, for example, if it takes you an hour 
like if it's 30 miles away by car, that's too, you can, you're excused. I was like, really? Wow. <laughs> it was like all these exceptions that I did. So, but it sounds like regarding the Sunday mass obligation, we might, we would have two schools of thought. One would be more rigorous. It seems like the rigorous is, is quite prominent today among the lay people that I know in the Roman right. It's rather rigorous. You know, I was, I was catechized. Like you don't, you don't miss Sunday mass unless you're deathly ill and you can't get out of bed. That sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I'm and this, on that. yeah, so this is actually where something's missing. This is why I do think, and I differ from, from certain very close Thomas on this. I think that casuistry has its place actually, because basically think about how Thomas lays out his. So I, I take the structure of Thomas as my approach to morals. Um, maybe I, I Byzantinize it a little bit, um, whenever I'm more practical nowadays, like for my teaching perspectives. But, um, when you get to each virtue, you still have to describe what that virtue looks like, right? So what's the virtue of religion as regards the precept of, of Sunday, Sunday masses and, um, and holy days of obligation, right? That's exactly where casuistry is very useful. It can give you very general rules, right? Like for instance, let's say that there's a a 30 mile thing, right? I mean, clearly that doesn't mean 30, uh, 29 miles or 31 miles. Like that, that there's this sort of, um, that it's an absolute precept, right? Like, yeah. or if you're a, you're a single person without, uh, you know, without kids um, and right. you have no flexibility. Schedule. Exactly. Right. So that, that last bit that we just did, that is testimony though, to the, the, the gap that exists between casuistry and the exercise of the virtue of prudence. Yeah. And the problem there is is that you can't write and this is ambrose garday in that book that i think we talked about a while back he makes this remark that's very striking he says you can't there's no prudence that's written down on paper you can't write prudence down on paper wow. um wow. that being said though there's also this wonderful line actually and i apologize in a trad circle for doing this to get you in trouble uh for citing maritan no, Mar- Mar- I, I i try to defend maritan because of because of you actually because uh, uh, he's I mean, writing yeah <laughs> He's writing against he's writing against kind of an existentialist position here. And he says, listen, you can cram the intellect filled with as much advice as you like. Right. It doesn't ruin your authenticity, which is what you know, sort of the existentialist uh, would, would sort of think. He said, you know, the the intellect is able to be crammed with advice because she, it lives on truth and she's more free by being filled with the, the various truths. Uh, of moral matters, right? So that's what casuistry provides. It provides this big battery of like general maxims that get closer and closer to what might be the case here for exceptions. But then you have to discern in view of that, you know, the church has approved certain authors. So, you know, what do I do in my particular case? You know, like my case, and we were we were talking a little bit about this beforehand. I live in Western Pennsylvania. So like if my church isn't isn't good, I could go to the Maronites next door because I know that they have a, a good liturgy. If um, if they're they're not an option, I've got like four or five Byzantine churches yeah. all around me, right? So uh, once again, it's hard to write down the exact requirement, right? Uh, in a in a kind of casuistic way, but it does give you a sense of, like you said, oh, there really are conditions that are not just I'm basically dying in bed of Ebola. Right. <laughs> um, so oh, I didn't mean for the thumb to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that that's that's uh, that helps, I think. And, um, go ahead. And maybe just to add another thing, because this is actually uh, what I'm saying is in Garagu. Garagu makes the same point. He actually takes seriously the casuist stuff and he actually has an account of it in his Beatitude. Always go to the Latin, not to the English. The English is not a good translation. I don't say that very often, but it is a paraphrase. <laughs> but he has an account of equiprobabilism in the Beatitude text. Um that tries to also interact with Alphonsus. But he also says this casuistry really forgets the importance of prudence. And he has this wonderful line where he says, how are you supposed to determine what, what holds for me, not you in my state of life, not your state of life with my temperament, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you know, and so uh, I, that's probably like the, the most important takeaway from like him, him in morals like a lot of the other moral stuff is all spirit is in spiritual theology. And I mean, that it ends up coming back to morals, but he has, he has a real focus on prudence that keeps coming up on and on, on and on throughout his works. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but well, another thing you miss in the Alphonsian scheme, if you do it is the, you have no discussion of beatitude, for instance, or the gifts of the Holy spirit. Uh, and so you, you lose the way to connect moral theology and moral perfection the way, especially of those who are who are progressing in the spiritual life, to or even the beginners to the mystical life, 
and you and that, lose. And that, like you said, that's the whole point. I, I mean, yeah. that that kind of summarize your title sort of summarizes. It. You know, made by God, made for God. This the whole point of this whole thing is to go to heaven and know God now, know Him yeah. now, and know Him in the in the life to come. That's the and to have, why we're concerned about rules. Yeah, and to have basically those rules of the structure for actually living the foretaste of heaven now. Yeah. It's the it's the crucified and pilgrim for foretaste, which is the state of way while we are you know b before the before death, but. Yeah, the, the life of beatitude begins, like St. Thomas says, even here, because grace is a kind of beginning of glory, but it's one that we can lose, one that we can fall into mortal sin against. And so, therefore, you need to then have the ascetical struggle, etc. But you need to always sort of see the connection between asceticism and mysticism. And I'm probably more, like, tuned to that. I, I, I fell into that when I was a Roman Catholic, but then very tuned to it because of teaching Byzantine students in particular. Yeah, I, I was just looking at prumer's structure and it seems like he doesn't i don't i thought that he had dealt with fruits and gifts of the holy spirit but maybe i'm wrong i don't see it yeah i have to look here another. anyhow uh yeah. well let's, let's move on to another lay moral question that has to do with the third commandment as well and that is buying things on sunday and mm -hmm. i think that the one of the and i if we have time we could get into the the one you mentioned which is how can, how far can i go with my girlfriend question question but this is <laughs> This is, <laughs> no, I mean, the only reason to say that with a smile is because that's what they say. Like, that's the question that the teenager actually poses. That's how he says it. Uh, and I'm laughing because I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a father. I have an older, I have older children. But um, the uh, the buying things on Sundays is, is difficult because there's because this de deals with that girlfriend thing, too, because all of a lot of these moral structures were passed down by oral custom. And people just did them without thinking, and they passed them down to their children. And there was also a, the whole system of social shame or not and whatnot. Um, and then we have all these social changes in society right after Alphonsus. Right? Alphonsus is, d dies right at the dawn of the first Industrial Revolution, urbanization. Things just get start breaking down, all these economic changes. And then suddenly the custom that had already been in place of never like not buying not conducting commerce on sunday breaks down because businesses are being open on sunday there's and there's also need new needs on sunday new economic needs on sunday that they didn't have back before that time so just to be, yeah, you know, just people know that we're not being lax with that just we can think of just um high-tech hospitalization right that could just buy you know we could come up with other things with i mean we come up with all sorts of other things in the supply chain but yeah oh yeah yeah, so I and it's interesting how Saint Alphonsus deals with this question in his moral theology. He he says you shouldn't buy on Sunday except this custom and except this custom and except he mentions all these different local customs that are happening in his day already, where people are buying things on Sunday for whatever reason. You've got a festival or whatever this sort of thing is happening, and then Prumer. By the time of Prumer, Prumer makes these all these distinctions as to what kind of commerce we're talking about. Are we talking about your your daily business commerce that you do as your you know normal business are we talking about necessities of life uh different kinds of work basically because yeah, it's all about servile work really is what it is and and primer basically says like you shouldn't buy things on sunday uh except if you have to you know buy food buy medicine things like that um, but he also says nowadays it's rather it's a little bit more lax now and, and people are buying things on Sundays more often. So comments on this particular aspect of the third com third commandment in our day. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, you, good, good introduction about how the social structure really like not just it doesn't just change it, but it also creates I mean, it, 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 it makes temptation more. Uh, it increases the, the amount of temptation to act against the commandment. Um, I'm not a, a hard rigorist on this, but I myself even accuse myself if I find myself, you know, even, you know, let's say um, we're planning the week and, you know, we live a little bit, you know, where we live. And and so we're just a little bit away from town. Right. right. Um, but, you know, you think, well, you know, the kids are going to be at ECF, the CCD equivalent that we have in the Eastern Church. You know, we could just stop over and do our grocery shopping during then, right? Because that's, you know, there's time. We don't have to waste time going off the mountain. I don't like doing that. Um, I, I think that that's, that's an example of, of encouraging 
you know, basically just endless commerce that, you know, it's basically, it's, I'm one more piece. I'm not going to change the system, but I'm one more piece in a system that flattens out the week, that flattens out the idea of time, that flattens out the old Christian distinction, especially, you know, of the, the Sunday, the, the religious Sunday feast. Um, that being said, you know, we came back from a trip and we had seven hours worth of delays for our flight. And so we got home at midnight on a Saturday with right. nothing. Like very little in the house because we had been away for a week, you know. I mean, we could have been, we couldn't have gotten gotten by fine. But then we also had my in laws coming over on Monday to help with my kids whenever I went back to work. And my my wife just works very part time, but it's on Monday. We do it the same the same day that I go to the seminary, well, this semester at least. Um, and so we didn't want to leave my in laws with just an empty cupboard when they have kids, right? So we ended up going shopping on a day on, on that Sunday when the kids, uh, maybe it was just after liturgy. I can't even remember. Um, and that didn't stick it, stick with me too much. Um, you know, but wasn't the ideal of like what I would do on other days, but in that one case I could discern, this is, I think an exception. Um, when I, one of the issues is that we, it's very useful to have authoritative casuistry, yeah. like I was doing at the time. He was kind of saying, here are the customs, but here are the ones that I'm going to recognize as a teacher of the faith, right? As being legitimate. And part of the issue is this, that everything's so lax in church teaching right now that you have, right. this is batted away. So when you go to confession and you mention this, I, I'm lucky I've had generally good confessors of late, but if you mention at least it was a venial sin against the third commandment, like, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have the sense that it was a mortal sin, Father. Yeah. You know, sometimes people will just bat it away. Luckily, my confessors, you know, don't. Um, I think it is important, though, to, to avoid, A, this kind of commerce, because it's just being part of this, this horrible, endless capitalistic cycle of, of just flattened out time, which is totally anti-Christian. This is yeah. totally anti-Christian. And you're not going to change it, but you, especially if you're a parent, you have the duty also to form your children to view time in a Christian manner. And it's, yeah. it's very important. Um, well, let's, let's just, just because we've already mentioned it twice. Let's talk about the sixth commandment regarding the courtship, because it, I'm not, especially, good at this because I don't, I don't handle it all that often. Okay. So well, okay, I don't, and I want to be careful because I want to be very careful there because I, I I'm going to tend to be, I tend to be a two to your wrist. <laughs> um, you mean you're more rigorous in that? Yeah. Way? Oh, okay. Yeah, but I want to be very careful as to not tempt people into, into a kind of scrupulosity. Sure, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm an older man. I'm almost 40 years old. So like, <laughs> different. I, I still have temptations. Don't get me wrong. Sexual sin is something that we need to remember that like the concupiscence remains around. Um, mm -hmm. That question, that that quintessential 16 year old question is not quite the same. Right. Because for me, it still happen in marriage. But, you know, if it happens outside of marriage, right. <laughs> doesn't matter how far you go. I think it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, the structure. Uh, this is something that parents deal with because yeah. um i know your oldest are younger but you know parents are dealing with this thing now they have children who are they want to engage in courtship with other pious catholic families and you got all these you know we've got all these pious catholic parents and they want to they want to be good catholics but they just don't know how to do this and they're trying to do it and then you know you're 16 years old you're 17 you're 18 you know that you're you're feeling like you did then you know so it's I think it's a it's a confusing and very difficult topic. So, yeah. Um mm -hmm. but I, the the thing that I'll I'll just I'll just make one comment and and get your thoughts and that was from St. Alphonsus where he says that according to the local custom of a place like in America or whatever there are things called chaste touches which is like I shake your hand Dr. Minor that's what I do uh, you know and uh, a female you might hug sometimes or like in france you kiss each other's cheek those are chaste touches because they are socially accepted to be totally not sexual whatsoever it's just a, a you know a gesture of friendship and alphonsus kind of says that those are the those things are um sort of the permissive things in a romantic relationship um because they're they're sort of socially accepted as chaste but they're already romantic because you have a romantic relationship. So they already have a romantic element that you wouldn't have with anybody else just by that very fact. Mm -hmm. But then when you get into uh, contrasting that with um, the actual in, in marriage, the contrast is that 
this touching is immediately ordered to sexual arousal. It, it, it causes sexual arousal immediately and therefore it's ordered, ordered to the Marilyn brace. So there's a, there's, you can, you can make a big difference there because chase touch, there's no sexual arousal in a chase touch, even in a romantic relationship, mm -hmm. you know, there's a romantic element to it, but it's, it's a chase touch. So what are your thoughts on that distinction? Well, I think that's, I think that is actually the essential distinction, figuring out what that looks like. Once again, I, the, the issue is when you're 16 years old, I mean, the the uh the domain of chase touch is very small <laughs> yes true it, true it's right. important i mean so i think that i almost think like because i'm thinking as a parent too like how am i going to approach this because the nice thing is it's all girls which is really bad in some sense but that also means that i get to be the threatening dad yep. to any guy who comes um i i think it's i think it's realistic to, to be ready <sighs> to deal with basically the venial sins, at least if I hope it starts there um, that are going to occur, because I think you actually have to be without, without being emotionally uptight, you have to be volitionally very much in control actually. And I don't, I think that the, the domain of chase touching is, is small. Now that being said, I don't, you know, since I don't do the casuistry, I don't know what to make of then if you start looking at the texts where it's, you know, handholding these questions and, and things of that sort, I, I just, I, you know, I would say that there's at least good reason to listen to that, but I want to be very careful not to start this underbelly of kind of scrupulosity around my remark. But I think for young people, it's very important. And I think that especially given how young men, young men have always been adventuresome, but think about how many young men from the age 10 and onward are super sexualized because of pornography. Right. Um, I, I think that you have to almost, you have to actually teach your kids sexual asceticism. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the, the problem is, right. is having a model. It, we only learn to do this by modeling. And the real temptation is to, by way of reaction to the, the culture, by way of reaction to where things even are now or in our own upbringing, that we tend towards something that's going to become so it becomes repressive and not, you know, not ascetical. I think there's a distinction to be made between asceticism and repression. And, you know, you have to find a way to, to raise in a proper right, raise properly ascetical children. Very, it's an interesting, yeah, an interesting distinction between repression and asceticism. That's good. You know, I don't know like what, I don't know how this, you know, actually would work out, but imagine kids who are, who are raised where you take seriously the fasting seasons of the church. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they take time. Like that's what we're doing is trying to figure out like how to take time to slowly, but surely get them, get our kids up to, you know, full, full par of what they should be doing. Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, Ruthenian church is pretty lax anyway. So, I mean, you know, working toward like the, the, the Orthodox goal, though, of like a full monastic fast, right? Even if you're even if you're just approaching that, right? And your kids have basically grown up where, you know, my, my middle child, who, she likes sweets. Um, every child does, but she particularly seems to. She asked, Mommy, is this a fast day? <laughs> so, just, <laughs> you know, um, right. But if they start to have an idea of that, I mean, even if they, they sin against um chastity in some way they have a framework though that that already gives them this idea that my appetites aren't infinite they're not supposed to be just indulged and yeah. I, I think that you're actually on your way to a healthier christian culture if you see this connection between in this case it's just one species of temperance and another one that's why traditional ascetical texts really make this connection between fasting and and then um chastity yeah, that, that's that's a really great. I, I love what you just said, because it's that's that gives I, I have one older child, three younger child children and the importance of tea, especially for the boys. I have two boys <laughs> teaching them fasting. I told my son he has to in, in order for him to be initiated into manhood, he has to complete a, a like a full hardcore Lenten fast, like vegan 46 days. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, that's that's great to start that early and then they're already they already they have the tools to actually have chastity to have temperance that's great actually well we're all out of time hey we'll have to talk about the fourth commandment next time which i do want to talk, talk about, about the gift of the holy spirit and all that stuff yeah. i love all the other stuff. so what, what what what's gonna happen is i'm gonna i'm gonna read through the book get through it and then we'll have another podcast talk more about moral questions and <clears throat> if you all want to comment below any moral questions you want me to throw at dr minard Please do. Once again, the uh, made by God, made for God, Ascension Press. 
Dr. Minard. Thank you so much for your expertise and for writing this book. It's great to be here. Well, Thanks. let's uh, end with our, as we always do, but we'll do it in the Byzantine style. Uh, <clears throat> Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever to two ages of ages. Amen. More honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. Thou who without stain bearest God the word, and art truly Theotokos, we magnify thee. Amen. Mm -hmm.